All right. Welcome, everybody. Going to get started here and just give it just a few more seconds for a few more people to jump on. And we will dive into our low pro co call for June, even though it's September, uh, this being our nice little uh, reschedule of the June call. So welcome everybody. I am Chef Jess from Nourish Colorado. And these are our monthly low pro co calls, local procurement Colorado, all about continuing conversations around farm to school in our state, what's possible, what's happening, and what you can potentially be doing to continue this movement and building and sustaining it. So as a little reminder, every single call is recorded. Um, I share them out afterwards. They're also available on our YouTube page and I'll send out that link as well. Um, all of the recipes that we share on these calls are also going to be shared out with you all. And um, please try to keep yourself <laughs> muted, of course. Give me done really good on all of the calls and haven't had barking dogs. And of course, this one, we have the barking dogs. Okay, so I'm going to continue on um, because we are talking about, they're really barking, June. <laughs> so in June, um, again, this call has been rescheduled um, and now we're doing it here in September. But our plan was to talk about all on how to sprout conversations. Um, so that we can build that farm to school movement. And then our culinary topic was going to be on cucumbers and radishes, um, which was an excellent crop for June. And it's actually an excellent crop for the fall because these are both cold hardy uh, produce items that you can grow in the spring or in the fall. I'm sure you can still hear those dogs barking fiercely. Okay, so before we can talk about how to really start these conversations and sprout these seeds. It's good to have a little reminder on how, what those core elements of farm to school are. So there's three main elements. The first one is procurement, and this is the buying, the purchasing of local products, whether that's locally grown, raised, or produced. Then we have school gardens, and this is really gardens within the school connected to the community that are also connected back to the school. And then we have food, agriculture, and nutrition education. And there's a lot of different variances between these three main elements that can be very small, all the way up to completely encompassing the entire school and the culture of how the school operates to where it's fully woven in. And these three elements are not standing alone. They're actually all woven together. So as you're looking to sprout these conversations, and you need to know like where to start. One of the best ways to do this is to understand the why and to really have a good base foundation as to why this work is so important and so valuable. And a lot of this work has already been done when it comes to the why. So a lot of these resources are out there and I'm just sharing a couple of the highlights. There are uh, quite frankly, hundreds of different reasons why when it comes to farm to school. I'm just giving you a quick little overview of a couple that I feel at least resonate with me. And hopefully you can find a couple that resonate with you. So with the kids, what we are seeing is that farm to school is actually increasing access and consumption, which is really important, of that nutritious, high quality local foods. Kids are being able to receive hands-on learning related to food, health, agriculture, and nutrition. And we have also started to see School districts that have strong farm to school programs are noticing that they are experiencing gains in student achievement and meal participation. And these are two of those key driving factors that a lot of our schools are looking for. On the farmer side, what we're seeing happening is that this is giving our farmers the opportunity to diversify their market channels and increase exposure of their products. It's really fantastic when a child can be in school and they're maybe eating something like a wacky apple and then they happen to see that at the grocery store 
and they're there with their parents and they're like, oh my gosh, I had this wacky apple at school. It's the best apple ever. Let's buy it. Like these are the things that we really want our kids to actually be driving our parents to be more aware of. It's also creating and or strengthening some of the financial opportunities for our farmers, whether that's by giving them more jobs or if that's even leading to increased income for them. And we're seeing that for farmers who are really adopting a values-based model of growing and raising their products, and then our institutions are focusing on that values-based procurement, this is leading to more support, investment, and interest in the work that they're doing. And this is things such as uh, animal welfare, uh, making sure that we're taking care of the land that we're growing the products on, managing our water, uh, creating more of a healthier, stronger soil, lots of different ways to really support this values-based procurement and use our farms and our institutions to really further um, the work that we're doing to create a better environment for all of us. And then our communities win as well. And so with this, what we've seen is we're starting to build family and community engagement between schools and farms. We're strengthening the local economy and bringing more state and federal money in. And we're also starting to see how these good environmental practices, such as reducing food waste and transportation related impacts are really starting to not only be kind of in silos within the institutions and the farms and what we're doing, but this type of work is starting to spread out into the community and they're becoming more aware of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch a poll. I'm gonna mute myself and get my dogs to be quiet because they are still barking furiously. And I'm gonna ask you all to choose out of all of these reasons that I just listed, which ones are resonating the most for you? So take a few seconds, fill this out, and I will be right back. One dog starts barking, they all start barking. So give you all just a few more seconds to fill this out as I am very curious to see what is resonating with you all out of all these different reasons. There's silence now, no more barking dogs. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and I will share the results because what I'm seeing so far is it seems like most of you all really feel that the kids winning by increasing the access and consumption of nutritious high quality foods is a big reason. Some of you love the hands-on learning, uh, the gains in student achievement. Farmers winning is a big one that's resonating as well and a couple on the community. Um, but I think it's very important that with this, when we're looking at all these different reasons, that you hold these reasons in your pocket and the ones that are especially resonating with you, because this is how you're going to be able to start building these conversations um, when you're really looking to spread the good word about what's happening in your community with Farm to School. Okay, so now I'm going to give you some time to think about that, and we're going to go into our first uh, culinary section. And so we, again, are talking about cucumbers and radishes. And these two items, I mean, cucumbers have been cultivated for millennia, honestly, in India. And there's a lot of really wonderful benefits about cucumbers. And I'm actually going to share an excellent video that Chef Fernando found on YouTube um, from a gentleman who basically explains the wonders of cucumbers in less than a minute. And he does it honestly a lot better than I ever could. So let me pull that up, share it with you all, and introduce you all to the wonders of Maca B. Welcome to Maca B's Medical Monday. Today it's all about this the cucumber. 
or as they call it in Jamaica, cucumba. Cucumba. Vitamins, minerals, very high number, silica, hair and nails get longer. Other vitamins make your bones them stronger. Anti-wrinkle make you look younger. 95% hmm. water, kidney cleanser, great hydrator, detox, fiber, good regulator. Give your body good things, don't be a traitor. Get the cucumber, cut it in a slice, put it in a jug of water overnight. You know what you get for a fraction of the price? Energy drink full of electrolyte. Roaring salad is one of the use uh, as a base for your vegetable juice. Another that's surprise put a slice on your eyes take away the dryness revitalize oh yes one thing i have left cucumber can also help with bad breath wash away the bacteria that cause the odor cucumber water instead of soda a maccabee a medical monday cucumber welcome to maccabee's medical ah, i hope you all enjoyed that as much as i did and i will say that uh maccabee you can actually look him up and he has these little one minute video shorts all about a lot of different fruits and vegetables and spices and herbs out there. It's um, quite a lovely rabbit hole that you can go down to and very fun. So that's all the great stuff about cucumbers or cucumba, if you would like to say it, um, as he does down in Jamaica. Another thing that I learned about cucumbers is that they're actually a berry and they're in that melon family. So whenever you slice into a cucumber, you might actually kind of smell almost a little bit like you're eating a honeydew melon. And that is why. Um, nice little personal antidote about myself is I'm not a big fan of honeydew melon, nor am I really a big fan of cucumbers by themselves. And I think it's because of that correlation and that I can pull out that type of a honeydew kind of melon taste in those cucumbers. When it comes to radishes, these have also been cultivated for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, they did originate in Asia. These are another low calorie food, just like our cucumbers, um, and they are packed full of flavor. And they can be pretty pungent. Uh, some people might actually kind of consider them spicy, um, but this is a pungency and it comes from an enzyme that creates the spiciness in your mouth. And then when we talk about uh, the recipes that we're going to share with you, we'll tell you how you can tame that spiciness. Um, cool things about radishes is that they're usually used as a companion crop or a trap crop. So they're not really like, uh, they're a bit resistant to a lot of diseases, but what they do is they actually plant them in the ground to trap a lot of the other bugs and the bugs will come and eat the leaves, but the radishes are still good to be able to eat and harvest. Um, and we also wanted to highlight this radish festival. This happens down in Oaxaca, Mexico, every single Christmas holiday. Um, the event has its origins in the colonial period where these radishes were introduced by the Spanish. And Oaxaca, Mexico, actually has a long wood carving tradition. And the farmers began carving the radishes into figures as a way to attract the customer's attention at the Christmas market. And so as you can see, this little image down here on the bottom is actually showing effectively the, um, oh my gosh, the feast. Uh, where the Last Supper right there with Jesus that they were able to carve out of radishes. Um, you can look this up and see all the amazing things that they have been able to carve out of radishes. And it's really cool. It's just one of those fun facts that you can use and share, especially when you're looking to sprout these conversations. And now I'm going to go to the culinary video with Chef Fernando, who's going to share all about cucumbers and radishes from the culinary point of view. Hello, welcome to your culinary station. Today, we're gonna to be talking about two vegetables that grow so well here in Colorado, and they go great in spring and summer recipes. They are cucumbers and radishes. We're gonna be sharing some recipes, some tips and tricks, and we'll introduce you to some varieties that you've probably never seen before. So let's get started. We're gonna begin with cucumbers. And you probably heard the saying, cool as a cucumber, and when I think of cucumbers, the first thing that comes to my mind is refreshing. I can picture myself in the spa getting a nice facial with my cucumbers in my eyes. So refreshing, right? And you may be wondering, how do they get their flavor? Well, as they grow, they get larger, become less acidic, and develop some sugars, and that's how they get their refreshing flavor. In the kitchen, Typically, you will see them used in cold preparations like salads or pickles, but when it comes to cooking, they are one of the most underused vegetables in the kitchen. 
If you ever get some takeout from an Asian restaurant, you will notice in some of their hot meals, they use cucumbers and stir fries are a great way to use cucumbers. When you go buy your cucumbers, there are usually two types available year round. We have our American cucumbers and we also have the English cucumbers. Let's talk about the American cucumbers first. The American cucumbers are dense fleshed and flavorful. They have some wax on the outside, so we recommend washing them under running water really, really well to get rid of the excess wax. You may be wondering, why do they have wax in them? Well, they add the wax to prevent loss of moisture. So wash them really well, and you can also peel them because their skins are tough, so peeling them is a good idea, or if you want, you can just stripe them and you'll give them a really nice appearance, all right? The seeds, they're kind of watery and bland, so they really don't contribute much flavor. So if you have the time, it's a good idea to take the seeds out, all right? English cucumbers, you will find them in the store wrapped in plastic, which means they have not been waxed. And when it comes to cleaning them, it makes them a lot easier because you don't really have to scrub them that hard. Their skins are thin, so we can eat them with no problem. So they are easy to prep. However, when it comes to flavor, they are less flavorful than the American counterparts. We also have another type, which are the Kirby ones. And the Kirby ones are a small, they resemble like a small American cucumber, very dense, tough skins. But if you can picture this in a pickle, these are the ones that we use mostly for pickles. And I have two varieties over here. I have Korean Kirby, and I have also Iranian Kirby cucumbers. Other varieties that you may be able to find are lemon cucumbers. They are round, yellow, they look like a lemon, but they taste like cucumbers. They're so cool looking. We also have Armenian cucumbers, and funny thing about them, they are an elongated African melon. It's so awesome. And also, if you have a garden at school or at home, we recommend finding different seeds of different varieties so that you can try them and expose your kids to different kinds of cucumbers. They grow so well here in Colorado. Let's talk about radishes now. And some of them tend to be spicy, right? You've noticed them, but I have a fun fact for you. You may be wondering, why are they so spicy? They have an enzyme on their skins that gives them their pungency. So if you peel your radishes, you'll be able to tame their spiciness a little bit. Another trick, you can cook them as well. You'll reduce their pungency and bring out their sweetness. So let me show you what I got real quick. These are spring radishes. These are the most commonly used here in the United States. Um, and this is an early crop. If we leave them in the summer heat, they will turn harsh and woody. So we see them mostly early in the spring, early summer. Also, I want to show you my favorite radishes. These are Easter egg radishes. And look at the different colors, purple, pink, red, white. Imagine what they can do to your salads if you add all of these colors, which is great. And then I got some French radishes. These are long, skinny. You can serve them as they are. You can chop them, slice them. They, they just add so much good visual appealing to your items. The other one that I want to show you is a daikon radish, and this is a Japanese radish. They can grow up to a foot long and weigh six pounds. They can get a little bigger, but they have the mildest flavor of them all. We can eat them raw, pickled, fermented, or cooked. This is just another great radish to add to your meals. A couple other types of radishes are German and Spanish radishes. These have black and white skins. They tend to be larger, and we find them typically in the fall. These are perfect for braising and roasting. So check them out if you can get a hold of them. Another variety that we want to share with you are the watermelon radishes. And just look at the colors on these radishes. Imagine how they're going to look on your dishes. They contribute so much to them. Are you guys getting ready for some cucumbers and radishes? Coming up next, we got some great recipes to share with you. Hello. Well All right. <clears throat> so that was our cucumbers and radishes, the first part of our culinary section. And so now 
let's dive back into this whole concept around sprouting conversations. So we gave you some of the why as to why farm to school is so valuable and so important from the kids winning to the farms winning to the communities winning. Now it's important to start thinking about where you fit in because this farm to school movement, it is a puzzle and there's a lot of different moving parts and pieces within this puzzle. And there's a lot of different players within this puzzle. So we've identified 12 kind of main headers as to who all are the key players within this puzzle. And so if you look at this, you can see that we have our farmers and our ranchers, our distributors, which can range from the small distributors from like the co-ops uh, to food hubs, all the way up to the larger distributors like our vendors and the large broadliners like a Cisco and a Shamrock. We have our food service departments. So these are like the directors, the purchasers, the menu planners, those who are actually making the decisions about what they're going to be buying and serving. And then we have the kitchen teams. And I separated these out because in some rural school districts, the food service director is also the kitchen team as well. However, there's usually two different roles here. And the kitchen teams, these are the people who are cooking the food, showing up every single day and preparing the meals that our kids are eating. Along with that, we have our food manufacturers, we have our state agencies, whether or not that's our Department of Education, Department of Ag, uh, Department of Health and Environment, they all play a different role. Within the health and safety side, you're going to see health and safety from the retail food establishment point of view, which is CDPHE, and then also from the producer rancher point of view, which would be USDA, and that's when we're looking at things like uh, group gap, uh, good handling practices, good agricultural practices, things along those lines. And then we have our students. These are our customers. And it's very important that you're thinking about the kids as customers. Um, our school districts are effectively one of the best, if not largest restaurant in some of these communities. Uh, when you start really thinking about all the meals that they are serving. And these kids are the customers who are consuming this food and we need them to know what's happening. We also have our county extension specialists, ag associations, um, our legislators all play a role in this puzzle as well. If they are on board and supporting this work, it's amazing what can really start happening when they are passing bills that are designed to benefit and provide resources so that this work can continue. We also can't forget about our educators and those administrators, um, the teachers, the principals, the leadership, especially teachers who are doing things like family and consumer sciences, career tech education. There's a lot of really good connection points here. And then we have all of our other partners who are out there in the mix as well. So the local nonprofits, community groups, uh, groups like Hunger Free Colorado, Cooking Matters, the Blueprint to End Hunger. There's a lot of different ancillary groups out there that are also focusing on this and can really play a key role in building this farm to school movement and are part of this puzzle. So based on your role, who can you potentially be sprouting conversations with? And I'm gonna start with a farmer here. So if I'm a farmer, I can talk to my workers. If I happen to have, you know, even a small farm that has a few workers come in or maybe even some volunteers or all the way up to some of the middle-sized farms and larger farms, let your workers know what you're doing when it comes to farm to school, just offhand. And we'll give you a formula here for this. Your customers are also people that you can be sprouting conversations with. Again, if you happen to be going to the market, you have CSA boxes, um, whatever way that you are engaging with your customers, these are excellent touch points to also share a little bit about what you're doing when it comes to farm to school. You can talk to your neighbors right next door. Be like, hey, did you happen to know this is what I'm doing? There's nothing wrong with sharing the good news. And then if you have your own kids, you can also share with them too. You wouldn't be, you would be surprised to know just how little some of these kids know and then also just how much they know. And sometimes it's the kids being like, oh, that's my dad's ranch that you're buying that beef from. Um, that's really cool. He told me about this. And then all the other kids are hearing it from this kid and it just builds that excitement. What if you're a cook? Who can you potentially be talking to? Well, first is the students as they're coming through the line, when they're sitting in the cafeteria, as you pass them in the hallway to go to the bathroom or drop off some stuff at the front desk, you can be chatting with the students. And again, this does not have to be long conversations. We're really looking for just quick 
little tidbits to really share the good that you're doing. It's also important that we're talking with our school administrators and our custodians as well. Um, you would be surprised at how much, you honestly shouldn't be surprised at how much the custodians know because they are the ones who have access to all of the classrooms. They know all of the teachers as well. They're there helping you out in the cafeteria as well during meal service. These are people that you should be letting know what's happening to keep building this movement. And then just your friends in general that you could be talking to. Again, just little one-off comments about what you're doing because we're trying to sprout conversations. We're just planting seeds uh, and then they start to grow. And then if you're a food service director, you gotta talk to the parents. We've seen this across the board where the parents really have no idea what's happening in these school meal programs. So you need to get out there and you need to be sharing the good that you're doing. You also need to be talking to your cooks. I've seen this happen where I've gone into a school and they have a big old bag of radishes that they're now having to cut and prep when they used to not have to deal with radishes before. And the cooks have no idea that this is actually coming from the farm down the street. <clears throat> so you need to be communicating with your cooks, honestly, before that product even arrives in their kitchens. Um, they should be involved in the process from the very beginning because they are the ones who are handling this food. You can talk with your neighbors as well. And you should also honestly be talking with your superintendent too. Um, on top of that, really any type of positions of leadership in your school from superintendent to school board to uh, if you happen to have a local BOCES chapter, you should be talking to them as well. And I think what's important is that, and I'm gonna share a little another personal story. I'm a bit of an introvert. I uh, believe it or not, like I actually really have a hard time talking to others and talking about myself, the good work that I'm doing, um, sharing it, sharing my hopes and dreams for the future. I tend to be more of a kind of quiet, reserved person. So for me, it can be a bit challenging to actually get out there and talk about the work that I'm doing and share it in a way to where I feel like I'm not bragging. I'm just using it as a way to stimulate a conversation. And so the thing is, is that you need to talk about this. This work cannot happen if we aren't talking about it. And the cheapest option is to talk about it. This is a no cost out of your pocket type of thing that you can do to really start building this movement. And again, we're talking about small things all the way to the big things. It all counts and it needs to be shared. And so we have a formula for you all because I'm the type of person who also needs a formula to be able to help me have some of these conversations and break out of my shell. And the first, you need to share your enthusiasm. Then you need to have that compelling reason. And then you need your closing statement, your hope for the future. Now let's see what this looks like. So from a food service director's point of view, what this could be, food service director's like, I'm so excited about the fact that we have started buying local melons from Hannigan Farms over in La Junta. Just imagine how delicious those freshly picked melons will be. And I know that our kids will be excited to know where these melons come from. And I hope that this first step leads to more kids eating our delicious meals. That's it. That's something that you can say to start sprouting these conversations and planting the seeds. What about from a farmer's point of view? You could say something like, I'm so eager to begin selling my produce to McClave School District next fall and expand my business. I can't wait to build this relationship and expose the students on McClave to who we are and what we grow. That was less than five seconds. And it was a very easy way to be able to share what you're excited about, what's happening, and what you're hoping can also happen as well. So we want you to use this formula to really start sprouting your own conversations. Identify your role, start figuring out what's happening in your community or what you might be doing to further this movement, and then start crafting your sentences. Because this is different than an elevator pitch, which can seem kind of bigger and harder to grasp. These are just small little tidbits that you're throwing out there uh, because good news does travel. And we want the good news to be the one that travels fast, more so than the bad news. So I'll give you some time to think about this. And then we're gonna go and we're gonna check in on our next culinary video 
and see what recipes we're making today. Are you ready to start cooking? Let's get cooking. But before we put our recipes together, we want to talk about this great machine. It is one of my favorites in the kitchen. It is called a sectionizer. And it's gonna, if you have one of these, it will make your life so much easier. I want to talk about the plates real quick. Um, they come with different plates and you can buy different ones. This one is an A cut wedger and you can do fruits and vegetables with them. We have a six cut or a four cut and they fit perfectly right here. And we'll be using that first. There's also a slicer and we'll show you that in a minute as well. But just to show you how many different cuts you can do with this machine. Before we start using it, we have to do a little prep. My radishes, before I put them through this machine, I had to do just a little prep. I cut the ends off and they're ready to go here. For my cucumbers, I'm gonna be making some half moons. I'm gonna be doing some spears. I'm gonna be doing a lot of different cuts, but before I had to do a little prep. But once we start going, you'll see it's gonna be super fast. Okay, we're gonna begin by making some cucumber spears. We'll use our sectionizer to do that. So let's take a look. Next, we're gonna be slicing our cucumbers. We're gonna be making some coins. And as before, you're gonna do just a little prep, make sure that you cut into the size so they fit in your slicer, and that's all you gotta do. So let's slice our cucumbers. And now we're gonna be making some half moons. And to make half moons, just like the other cucumber, but instead of leaving it whole, we wanna cut it right through the middle, just like so. So let me show you how to make your half moons. And here you have it. We have our cucumber spears, we have our coins, and our half moons all done with our sectionizer. Now, we're gonna show you how to make some wickles. And we're not doing this to preserve or to cannon, we're only doing this to enhance the flavor of our cucumbers. And we're gonna do it with a very simple recipe. We have some vinegar, some sugar, salt, and a little red crushed pepper. You can change up the flavors depending on what's on your menu to go with your theme. You can add garlic, ginger, soy sauce, change up the flavors so they really go with your theme of the day. And by the way, when we made this at a school, kids go crazy over quickles. They really like them. So let me show you how quick and easy it is to make quickles. And now we're just gonna let this sit for like 30 minutes before we serve them and they'll be ready. Okay, next we're gonna prep our radishes and you can wedge them or you can slice them. But if you're gonna be wedging your radishes, we recommend you getting radishes this size so that they don't get stuck. Because a little guy like this radish, he might get stuck with your wedger. So we're gonna be using our slicer and all of these radishes should work fine with this. So let's do that. All right, so we're gonna roast some radishes. And this recipe that we have, we'll share with you, but all you need really is a little garlic and onion powder, a little bit of oil, not too much, some salt, and just a little bit of black pepper. We're gonna give them a quick toss, pop them in the oven for about 10 to 15 minutes until they're nice and roasted and they have a little blister appearance and that's it. So let's do that. Next, we're gonna be making a radish slaw. It's gonna be super easy. First, we need to make a dressing to go along with it. Very simple. We have some oil, lime and lemon juice, a little bit of sugar, and some salt. Then we're just gonna pour that over all of our vegetables, mix it, and that's it. We recommend that you do this about 30 minutes before you serve it so that the flavors can develop. Are you ready? Let's put it together.
right. I was just lost in watching that radish slaw, which is absolutely delicious um, and is another great way to just jazz up your meals that you're enjoying at home. So a couple more tips about the cucumbers and the radishes that we showed you all. Um, cucumbers, they are delicious in um, just other different types of methods and just kind of in that fresh raw form that you might be used to. Um, people blend them into vinaigrettes. You can actually make a chilled cucumber soup. You can use it when you're poaching different types of fish if you're doing something like that fancy at home. Uh, if you wanted to get extra fancy, you can make a cucumber ice or a cucumber granita. Um, and we've also seen a lot of schools actually slicing cucumbers and putting them into water and having that for the students to be able to enjoy. And that's really light and refreshing. As we mentioned, if you happen to use cucumbers and you're going to cook with them, like with a stir fry, add them at the very end so that you're not making them mushy. You still want to retain some of that uh, good crunchy texture. Uh, tzatziki sauce, that is a yogurt and cucumber sauce. Um, if you happen to be doing some Greek meals, maybe you're serving like a gyro sandwich or something, that tzatziki sauce is classic and delicious and is really a lovely way to add a little bit more zest to the meal that you're serving. And again, try planting different varieties of cucumbers. There's a lot out there and they're really fun to watch them grow. When it comes to radishes, you can actually make a pesto with the greens, um, or you can just saute up the greens or chop them up and add them into some of your salads. Uh, and in Mexico, they actually use the radish greens to make a green mole. Another way to reduce that spicy flavor is to slice them and then put them in a bowl of ice water for about 20 minutes before serving, and that will tame some of that pungency that they have. If you've never had a sliced radish with butter and sprinkled some salt on top of it, you might be missing out. That's what the French do, and it is delightful. And do try that quick pickling method. It's delicious, and as Chef Fernando mentioned, the kids love them. They always are freaking out over the quickles. And as we continue to talk about sprouting these conversations, all of these different ideas and tips and tricks and fun tips about the different product, produce that we're showing, these are all ways that you can be using, um, kind of keeping these ideas in your back pocket anytime you're looking to sprout some conversations. And so back to this, it's important that we take the chance to seize every single opportunity. And we've all seen this. You can have somebody come up to you and they ask, well, how are you doing today? And you could just be saying, I'm good, thanks, and that's it. Or if they ask you, how are you doing today? You could say something like, I'm doing really well because of the super exciting farm to school project that we have going on. And that's going to be that seed that people might be like, oh, well, tell me more about this farm to school project. What are you doing? That sounds cool. And so Again, it's easy to just say, I'm good, thanks, and walk away. However, I want to challenge you all to really start seizing these opportunities and sprouting more of these conversations. Again, being a bit of an introvert, I like to have some conversation starters, some things that I can just kind of keep in my back pocket. So things like, what's your favorite vegetable? Do you have a garden? What do you like to grow in your garden? All of these things are ways that you can start sprouting some conversations that could potentially lead to things like, oh, well, guess what? We have this really cool program where we're growing lemon cucumbers in our gardens for the first time and the kids love them. Or I'm actually selling my produce to this school district starting next year. And that's my first time and I'm really excited about it. Or if you happen to be an outside partner, did you happen to know about our community efforts to support our farmers? Doesn't even have to be directly tied farm to school. It could be community workers working with the farms to really help support and elevate them and what they're trying to do. And so why does this matter? And I'm the kind of person where I tend to have a lot of ideas. Some ideas end up becoming, you know, an actual program or something along those lines. Other ideas, they just tend to die or fizzle out. But the thing is, is I don't stop talking about these ideas. And so We've got nine people on the call today. And if each one of you had a call or had a chat with 10 people right here, nine of you on the call and over the next two months, you just chat with 10 people about what you're doing when it comes to farm to school. That means that we're gonna have reached 90 people right there. 
And the reason that this matters is because you never know who you might be talking to. And so I have little stars in all of these little tiny boxes. And let's just, I mean, something that I've done is I've had an idea, kind of came forth in about 2018, and it was all about meal crediting and how schools can really look to shift the way meals are credited to be able to make it easier for them to actually cook from scratch and buy local produce and stuff. And this was just an idea. I thought it was a valuable idea. I started talking about it, never stopped talking about it, just mentioning it here and there, just little teasers like, oh, have you thought about it this way? Or, hey, what about this way of uh, potentially, you know, how to credit our meals? Nothing really happened for a handful of years, but I did not stop talking about it. And then finally, early this year, because I kept planting those seeds, and then the people that I was talking to, they had connections, they started planting seeds. We're now at a place where this has become a full-fledged feasibility study, and now we're looking at how we can potentially uh, get this funded at like the USDA type of level and getting into contact with the key players there. So again, if you're talking to people, these little red stars, this could be somebody who happens to you know, know somebody who works at their local farm credit. And that person just happens to be interested in supporting farm to school efforts. Or um, this could be somebody that you talk to and that person just happens to know somebody who excels at writing grants and they're looking to volunteer your, their time. Like that's a win right there. Get that person and harness their availability um, and grant writing ability. Um, you might even find that somebody happens to know a chef who you know, used to work in the industry and wants to start providing training to food service providers right there. Or it could be somebody who happens to know somebody who is like a higher up at a, maybe like the county public health department. And they're really looking to weave in supporting local sourcing to their county community plan. This is why it never hurts to just talk about it and just talk about it. I mean, this is really what we want you all to do. Because when you start talking about it, this starts to spread. Just like this meal crediting idea that I had gets to the right people. And before you know it, it is spreading and it's becoming this whole new thing that we all now need to start figuring out, which is good. Um, and also comes with its own challenges because now it's a whole nother project. So let's see this. We've got, you've talked to 10 people. And then out of those 10 people, two of them are deciding to share with others and each tell three more people. And so out of those three people that they shared with, they're now sharing with another now group of people. And then those people are talking to like 12 people. And then out of those 12 people, three more people are spreading the word and they're talking to 10 more people. And this goes on and on and on. And this easily multiplies out. And I am not a math in my head kind of person, um, but this is when you start looking at like that exponential growth. And this is how you build a movement. Free of cost right here is just by talking about the things that you're doing and what you're trying to do, even the ideas that you might have. You might not even be doing it yet, but you're talking about it and it starts leading to these different connections, which can ideally, potentially get you to the people who can actually make that idea a reality and or provide the resources and support to build more of a stronger foundation for the programs that you're running. Now, getting a little hungry. So what we're gonna do is we are going to watch the final video and see how these recipes came out. And, then we'll and here we have it. it. Here's Start that again. Pretty and delicious to go with your meals. And here we have it. Here's all of our recipes that we prepared today. Let's begin by reviewing our radish slaw. Look at the, those colors. Next to a barbecue, you can put them on the side of any entree, um, even by itself, some tacos, the colors, how beautiful your dishes will be. The roasted radishes, Again, we roasted different colors of them. So just like everything else, you can put them on the side of your entrees, maybe like even Thanksgiving. This will be so pretty and delicious to go with your meals. We have a stir fry 
It's just making me hungry. Look at that, the colors, all of the vegetables, beautiful. And the last one are quickles. Um, you may have to drain them, you know, before you serve them, of course, but imagine all the burgers, sandwiches that you can serve them with. Again, I have not met a student or a customer that doesn't go crazy with quickles. Check them out, try them, and we wish you happy cooking. Okay. So, as we're starting to think about how we can sprout the conversations, there are many, many opportunities that are coming out there for you. So, reminder, you need to share your enthusiasm, then you get that compelling reason, and then you have that closing statement or the hope for the future. And right now, coming up, there's a lot of good chances for you to talk about this. So we have child nutrition reauthorization. This is the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. Um, it's supposed to be renewed every five years. The last time this happened was in 2010. So they are a bit delayed. And um, what we're hearing from the federal level is that there is really a strong effort to actually get child nutrition reauthorized um, by the end of 2021, or at least at the very latest, uh, the like early 2022. So if you're into school food and supporting the policies around meal programs, this is the bill that you need to start really talking about and starting conversations around to ensure that our community is aware of like how this bill right here can either create opportunities for more farm to school efforts or potentially reduce those opportunities. And right now there's a marker bill in child nutrition reauthorization to actually increase the funding for the farm to school grant program, which is something that has been a huge success since it has been implemented in 2010. We also have our farm bill coming up. Uh, this is supposed to be, um, I think they're saying like 2023, but the conversations are starting now. And in 2022, these two bills, child nutrition reauthorization and the farm bill are like two massive, massive bills that really are huge when it comes to providing critical calories to vulnerable populations and also supporting our farmers and our ranchers. So start looking into the farm bill. Uh, we at Nourish, we host, a, they're like every other week, uh, calls about, they're called the Food Bill Action Team. So they're little policy calls. They happen every single Wednesday at noon, quick little 30 minute calls to make sure that we're continuing these conversations, sprouting these conversations around these bills and how they can impact the work that we're trying to do in a positive way. Colorado Proud School Meal Day is coming up September 21st. This is a great way for our schools to feature Colorado products. Um, one chance, one opportunity, once a year, governor uh, appointed type of program. This is really a cool thing that's put on by our Colorado Department of Agriculture. And this is a great way to really build excitement about what we're doing. October is Farm to School Month, okay? That's an entire month where if you are a school, you can just do one thing, just one thing using a local product and promote that. And then we also have our Mountain Plains Crunch Off. This is something that is uh, put on by our USDA Food and Nutrition Services. Um, there's a region, we're the Mountain Plains region, which includes Nebraska, Montana, the Dakotas, uh, I feel like I'm forgetting one, Wyoming. Um, every single year, Nebraska keeps winning. And all we're looking for people to do is to sign up and on October 20th, crunch into some crunchable produce, like an apple, some carrots, uh, a pear can work. We honestly just want you all to sign up and show, again, this commitment and excitement around Colorado growing and raised products. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There is a lot that's going on that you can really be sprouting conversations with. I just wanted to throw out some ideas for you all. And this is where we are. So save the date for our next call. This is our official September Low Pro Co call. It's happening on September 28th. Um, we are going to be joined by Andrea Alma from the USDA uh, Food and Nutrition Services. Uh, she's the Farm to School Coordinator. So she's going to share all the different ways our USDA Food and Nutrition Services supports Farm to School, giving us some really cool data on the new Farm to School census that came out, talking about the Farm to School grant, 
everyone who was awarded a grant for this last cycle and then the farm to school grant should also be very close to dropping. Whether it has dropped by September 28th or it's coming, this is a great way to start getting those ducks in a row um, so that you can be thinking about what you could be applying for with this farm to school grant. And then for the culinary side, we are talking all about peppers, uh, which is going to be really exciting because Colorado, we grow a lot of peppers um, and there's some really cool recipes that we'll be sharing for those. So that is all that I have for you all. You're welcome to stay on the line if you have any additional questions. Otherwise, I'm gonna take this time as a, you know, usually we run over. So now we're gonna make up some time by ending a little bit early. I will be here if you have any questions. Thank you so much. I'll share the recipes and the recording, um, hopefully by the end of this week, if not early next week. And have a lovely day. And I hope to see you all for uh, the next call on September 28th. Thank you. All right, if there's no final questions, I'm going to jump off and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Happy Tuesday and happy cooking. And yes, Derek, let's definitely chat and catch up. There is a lot happening and still happening. All right, you all enjoy your day.